Well, hello again. This is part five of the Seaberg SE100 service and rebuild series. Today, we will be working on the TSA-9 solid state amplifier. Now that we have the front of the cabinet off, we start by removing the two RCA jacks and then the mechanism connector. Next, we will loosen the screws and remove the speaker spades. You have a red, a blue, and a black wire. The black wire is the common wire. Now these wires are normally hanging loose and are not tied together, but if you feel ambitious, you can braid them like I did, which will make them more organized and easier to keep track of. To remove the amplifier plug, which is connected to the control unit. To release the amplifier, there is a lever at the top of the tray. Push down this lever and pull the amplifier out. The amplifier should now slide out freely. It is ready to be serviced. Moving on to the workbench. From the back of the amplifier, you have two sets of terminal blocks for the speakers of each channel. You have a bass switch, a treble switch, and an equalization switch. These should all be clean and move freely. As you might be able to tell, the original germanium output transistors have been replaced. The new output transistors are 2N2955. These are PNP type power transistors made by Onsemi in this case. Although these are much more reliable and easier to find, the circuit requires modifications in order to make them work, and we will be getting into that in a moment. So now moving on to the bottom of the amplifier. Once again, you can see that things have been modified. The amplifier has been fully recapped, and the original germanium transistors have been replaced with more reliable silicon types. We have BD140 and BD139 for the drivers, and for the output transistors we have MJ2955, which are PNP type. On the schematic, you will see that you have Q5107, Q5108, Q5109, and Q5110 are the transistors we will be replacing. And then you also have two resistors in each amplifier plus the bias pot. Here we have a picture of the original components. And as you can see, the original values will not work with the new transistors. But I will get into a bit more detail about this later in the video. Best thing to do is draw up a quick diagram so that you know where to start. We now proceed to move the wires of the old transistors. This can be quite the tedious process, so the best thing to do is just take your time while doing it. I decided that my best bet was just to leave the transistors mounted and push the wires aside. I don't really have a lot of advice for working on point-to-point -point terminal blocks like this other than take your time and make it look neat. Because you never know when there might be a day that someone will open up this amplifier and see the work that you have done. I don't have much to say about this part other than just observe how I remove the old components and then solder the new ones in. I am re-tinning the tabs of the terminal blocks to get the solder reflowing again. Because the old solder gets dirty and oxidized over time, it does not flow very well, 
and you need new flocks and solder to make a good solder joint. Time-lapse videos always seem to be interesting to me, as it allows you to see a much more dramatic progression of the project over a short span of time. I guess it's sort of like using a hyperdrive in a way. One moment you're at the start, and the next moment you're already done. Warp speed engage. After you have the old output transistors removed, take a clean piece of paper towel and wipe off as much of the old thermal paste from the old insulators as you can. Now with a sharp edged tool or knife, carefully peel off the mica insulators one at a time and clean as much of the old thermal paste off as you can, but try to keep your fingers off the main surface. Put the insulators aside and clean the heatsink surface. Now apply new thermal paste as evenly as you can in the general area of the insulators and drop the clean insulator in place. You can take each transistor and apply a generous amount of thermal paste to the bottom side. And remember that a little goes a long way. Line up and gently press the transistors in place. Then screw them down loosely at first to get an even pressure and gradually tighten the screws down one at a time. You want to try and keep even pressure on both sides of the transistor case for good thermal contact. Next is removal of the driver board to change out the bias pot. The original bias pot is not the right value to allow for proper bias of the silicon type transistors. Once you have the board removed, heat up the solder joints and use an edged tool to pry up on the pot tabs on the foil side of the board. Now remove the old pot and prepare the new one for installation. You can see the new pot I used has been modified to get the value that I needed as this project was a bit of a trial and error. I would recommend the use of a 1 half watt to 1 watt 200 to 300 ohm pot and this should get the job done. Set the pot around the halfway value. Now reinstall all the boards and connectors. Moving back to the driver output section, you can see I am now swapping out the old resistors with new values that were calculated based on a guide I found. 
In this case, 10 times the original value works okay, and you now have 330 ohm and a 750 ohm resistor in place of a 33 ohm and a 75 ohm. These should be rated at one half watt. Now, before you decide to give the amplifier full power, I recommend the use of a dim bulb current limiter. These are really easy to make and very handy for keeping the smoke in after doing a rebuild like this. The dim bulb current limiter consists of a 60 to 100 watt incandescent light bulb in series with the live side of the equipment you are powering. There are a great many uses for these in general, so don't go and throw out your old incandescent light bulbs if you still have them. It might just save your project in the event that you made a mistake. You can easily get everything you need at your local hardware store to build one of these for less than 15 to 20 bucks, which is much less than the cost of new set of transistors. The dim bulb may not prevent damage to components in some cases, but it should allow you to catch any sort of fault much sooner, as it will light up in the event of a miswire or a short circuit, and limit the power to the equipment. If all goes well, then it is time to bias the amplifier. To measure bias current, you will need to set your meter to the millivolt range and measure the voltage drop across the 0.75 ohm emitter resistor on each channel. I set the bias to drop around 36 millivolts, which is around 48 milliamps idle current through the output transistors. The standard for most class AB amplifiers seems to be around 40 milliamps but a bit higher is okay in the case of having a sizable heatsink. But always remember that the bias will increase as the amplifier warms up, which is why it is a good idea to leave it idle for a half hour, then check the bias again and turn it back down if it is too hot. An interesting trick that I found is that you can measure the base of the output transistors, which is a 0.65 volt reading you see on the meter, which shows you how increasing the bias pushes the base voltage higher, increasing current through the transistor. You can think of it like opening an electronic valve in a sense, but silicon transistors require a little more of a voltage push to open up. Germanium transistors only require around 0.1 volt on the base to bias, whereas silicon types require about half a volt, which is why you cannot simply swap them with each other. And with that, we have reached the end of the labor involved part of this project. Here are a few high res shots of key parts of the amplifier, including the bias pot. Bias transistor Q5106, replaced with a BC558, and the completed driver section. Oh yes, and a handful of the old components, one of which is an output transistor marked for death, while the rest are technically still good and will be saved. Before I finish things up, here is a complete list of components used and their associated locations on the schematic. I also recommend a few capacitor brands of preference from experience. Well that is all I have to cover for now. If you have made it this far, thanks for watching and I hope you found this video useful. I know it takes me a little while to do these, but stick around, because in the next part of this series, I will be getting into rebuilding the Tormac control unit. Thanks for watching, and happy spring!